And so, you know, one of the key concepts that I always speak about is don't give your children what you didn't have. Give your children what you didn't know. And so what I mean by that is growing up, my parents, they didn't really understand finances. You know, that wasn't their strong suit by any means. And there was times, a lot of times growing up, that financially we had some issues. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Thank you for joining us for episode four of the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. Today, we're discussing building character, creating legacy, and the importance of fathers, and joined by Jeff A.D. Martin. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. I got to say, Tanya and Brian, uh, thank you so much for allowing me to be on your podcast, on your stage, and just sharing my story. You know, I I am a father of three. I am a, a, a husband. And I'm just really somebody who always is looking to find a way to serve. I have been working in law enforcement for, for 16 years, and I've been blessed over the last 10 years or so to be a motivational speaker. I have, I have spoken across uh, all across Canada and um, in, in parts of the U.S. as well. And also, I'm an author of two books as well. And again, everything I do is really just about trying to help people to become the best version of them to help them to navigate through the difficulties that we sometimes have to deal with in life and really just try to step on, you know, as we go through things in life, I think it's important that we step on the stage of, you know, once we get past that circumstance, so we can now use that stage to stand on and help others as well. And so in everything I do, you know, coaching as well, and everything I do is always about trying to help others to become the best version of who they're supposed to be. Like it. Today, we really wanted to focus on building positive character in our children. So we have, you know, as parents, educators, grandparents, I think we all play a critical role. So we are looking for your expertise today on some ways to do this. Ooh, man, that, that's a great question. So again, as I said, you know, I am a father of three. I have three kings at home, 11, eight years old and two. And my household is super loud, super busy (laughs) with sports and all that stuff going on. But, you know, I'm so so blessed to have them. And of course, you know, just, you know, being a father, being an involved father, I've had an opportunity to really learn so much. I continue to learn. I'm always looking to learn just to see how I can become that better parent. You know, I've had my parents growing up. They're still alive today. They're still together. I'm blessed because I know not everybody has that. However, You know, growing up, my parents, because they came over from another country, they didn't really understand the school system. They didn't understand the concept of what Canada's life was about. And so they ensured that there was food on the table, that we had a roof, you know, over our heads. But ultimately, there was things that my parents didn't understand. And so, you know, one of the key concepts that I always speak about is don't give your children what you didn't have. Give your children what you didn't know. And so what I mean by that is growing up, my parents, they didn't really understand finances. You know, that wasn't their strong suit by any means. And there was times, a lot of times growing up that financially we had some issues, right? There's times the lights were turned off, the water was turned off, you know, we got evicted a couple of times, like, you know, there were some financial issues, but because I understand the system and because I was able to learn you know, and really advance my thinking in certain areas. Again, I go back to that saying, don't give your children what you didn't have, give your children what you didn't know. So I'll give an example, you know, growing up, I used to love me some Jordans. You know what I'm saying? I used to love some Jordans, (laughs) Um, (laughs) but my parents couldn't afford Jordans, right? And so growing up, I used to love them, especially them Jordan fours. Like those was, I was looking just kind of like being awe when I saw those, you know, somebody wearing those walking down the street. Now I'm grown, you know what I'm saying? I'm grown now, right? I can afford me some Jordans, right? In fact, I can afford Jordans for my boys as well. However, again, going back to the saying, don't give your children what you didn't have, give them what you didn't know. And what I didn't know was that Jordans would go up so high in value. 
And so what I've done now is change the game rather than going out and buy my children sneakers and not to say you can't do that, but it was about two, two and a half years ago, Nike re-released those same Jordan 4s. And I was so tempted to buy them for all of us, you know what I'm saying? So we can all walk around looking all cute. But we stood in front of that Foot Locker. And while we stood in front of the Foot Locker, we went inside and we bought the last two pairs. We didn't buy them for our feet. We bought them so I could teach my children financial responsibility and how to grow, how to sell and grow. So we bought those pair of shoes and we held them for six months. And then we sold both pair of shoes for $100 each on top of what we bought them for. And so now my children understand to buy something, to hold it, wait for the value to grow, and then sell it and use it to make money. And one of the things I did to my kids, I said, hey, let me ask you a question. You just made a $100 each on these pair of shoes, so $200. Let me ask you something. Did you have to go to a job that you, do, that you don't like to make that money? And they're like, no, daddy, of course not. And I was like, did you have to deal with a supervisor that you can't stand, that you know that you are smarter than? And they're like, no, daddy, of course not. How did you make this money? And they were able to explain, we bought something, we waited for the value to rise, and then we sold it, and we made money from that. That's one of the things I try to do with my children, and that I really try to share with others, is that we have opportunities to give our children information that we didn't know to help them to change their own life. And so because I understand financial wealth a little bit more than my parents, a lot more than my parents did, you know, I'm able to pass these things on to my children. You know, uh, st the stock market is another thing. I didn't know it growing up, right? That was something that seemed like an old rich white guy thing to me at the time, right? But my children now, because I learned it, my children at 11 and eight years old, they understand the stock market. They're talking about bull market and bear market. They're telling me about Tesla. They're telling me, daddy, Roblox went public the other day. Like they're telling me this information at 11 and eight years old. It's important that we learn information and pass it on to our children. So I don't want to make it, you know, another generation that walks around wearing these Jordans. Again, no disrespect, because I love me some Jordans even to this day, but it's about changing the game, showing our children something different than what we had. Right. There's so much there. There's so much there. Number one, personally, I can relate to. And there's just so many lessons in there as well. And, and one thing, there's a couple of things that kind of made me laugh to myself when you were talking there. You talk about investing kind of being, you, you know, you thought it was the white man's game when you were yes when, when you were younger. I remember being, I remember in school hearing kids talk about vacations. And I used to think, I thought, I, I thought until I was almost literally until I was like an adult that vacations were something for white people. I didn't realize that I could go on a vacation, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, would, would you talk about, uh, yeah, te te teaching your kids, uh, not, not giving them what you didn't have, but giving them what you didn't know. Yeah. Another thing too, my dad, I had my dad until a year and a half ago. He passed away in September of 2019. Oh, sorry and to hear that. Thanks. Um, ever since then, I've been spending a lot of time thinking about just the importance of fathers. And I think you're in a perfect position to kind of speak on that, being someone who's been involved with youth, who's worked in law enforcement, you really got to see what the impact is of, of not having a father present and obviously being a father of three yourself. I just like to get your insights on the importance of a father in terms of role model and, you know, and, and really just building that character. Yeah, you, you know, Brian, I, I wish I had the numbers in front of me. I, I don't, but I, I made a video on this some time ago where I speak about the specific numbers of men who are in jail. And most men are, who are in jail don't have a father figure. Most men who are in jail have never had that type of influence in their life. And it's really a testament to the fact of children needing to have that influence around. Now, of course, you know, there are some circumstances where, you know, single mom, you know, she doesn't have that person around. She can't, you know, for whatever reason, that, that, that male role model is not around in terms of being that, that specific father. However, I think it's still important that our children still have some type of role model if they can have it, whether it be a, a brother, whether it be a, a, a grandfather, you know, someone that could perhaps stand in that role. Because the truth is, is that we have young boys who are out there who are learning what it is to be a man by other young boys. And those other young boys are, are the rappers that you hear playing on, on, on TV. Sometimes they're the basketball players that you're seeing on TV. And these guys are running around. Some of them are running around because they don't have that influence, but they have the stardom now. They have the, 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 the spotlight on them. Our young boys and young girls look up to them as role models. And these guys should not be role models, 
right? And again, no disrespect to some of these guys because they just simply don't know better. However, when you are in that music video and you're flashing the car or the music, and, you know, and the, 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 you know, the lifestyle, you're going to have a generation who's going to look at you and want to emulate that, right? Growing up, we had the same thing. And I remember Master P specifically, Master P in his older years was like, yo, I apologize for the music that I put out. He apologized, right? The problem is, is that it's too late. Right. Because the things that you said in your lyrics and the things that you, you showed had an impact and a negative impact on some of our boys, not just him. I'm not picking on Master P only, but the music that we were given, you know, the way it treated women, the way it talked about glorifying selling drugs and, and being in gangs. And this is what our young men have to listen to and, and people to look up to. So I do think it's extremely important that we try to get role models for our young men and again, young women as well. And even if that dad is not in that child's life, and of course, you know, we, we can't control that always. If, if there is a grandfather, if there is an uncle, if there is a close friend who's a male who can really have that impact on that child, I think it's vital for their growing up because we need to see somebody who looks like us. I think representation matters. And when you can see someone who looks like you working as a doctor, it now shows you that you can potentially become that doctor. You can potentially become that lawyer because someone who looks like you or resembles you. And so again, as children, children need to have role models on both sides, and the, the mother figure and the father figure. And if that, if, if the person who is responsible for that child's life is not in that child's life, then again, I think it's important that that individual, that parent does do their best to try to find somebody who can perhaps step in and, and help in that area because our children need it. Absolutely. And, um, you know, you mentioned the numbers. I pulled up some numbers here while you were, uh, while you were talking and there's, you know, these are U.S. numbers, but I think they're, they're, they're going to really parallel what happens in Canada. Yes. So, you know, when we talk about people who are raised without their father, 63% of youth suicides are from fatherless homes. 90% yeah. of homeless and runaway children are from fatherless homes, which is 32 times the average. 85% mm. of children who show behavior disorders come from fatherless homes. Uh, it, it just, you know, the list just goes on and on. When we talk about incarceration, uh, again, even when, even when income is controlled, the, the odds are still significantly higher of someone being incarcerated coming from a, coming from a fatherless home. Mm. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, the, you know, it really speaks to everything that you've, that you've said there. Yeah, absolutely. And those numbers, you know, I imagine, you know, I, I don't know if they've been the same for, for, you know, how many years or they've gone up. But, you know, the sad thing is that, again, you know, we see these numbers because of the lack of mentorship in that child's life. And, you know, as a man, Brian, you could probably, you know, I don't know if you could attest to this or not, but oftentimes men don't share. Men don't oftentimes share their feelings. When we go to the barbershop, the most vulnerable you'll get is I'm talking about LeBron James or who's the best, you know, football player ever, or, you know, talk about some, you know, some celebrity girl that you have a crush on or whatever. But that's the extent to the most part of our vulnerability. Men don't share. Men don't talk about the pain that we can go through. We don't talk about the issues that we struggle with. We don't talk about what it's like to be a father and 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 the, the, the struggles and the the trying to navigate through being a husband. You know, these are things that we don't share. And so again, when you, when you have a young man who doesn't have an older man to talk to, to learn from, then we're not passing on the lessons that need to be passed on. You know, I heard somebody say once that when you look at young girls, the toys that they have prepare them for adulthood right? Little girls have dolls that will pee and that will poop and that will vomit. And you, know, you have to feed the doll or the doll will cry all night. You know what I'm saying? It's preparing that, that young girl for motherhood. As a young girl, oftentimes girls will dream about their wedding even before the man is in the picture. You know what I'm saying? They know what dress they're going to wear. They know where the wedding's going to be. It's going to be in Nepal or Brazil. You know what I'm saying? They know what the ring is going to be a, you know, diamond cut, whatever, even before the man is in the picture. But as men, we don't have that. As men, we don't have the things that guide us. Again, with young girls, and you know, it, 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 it can be considered stereotypical. However, you have the easy bake oven as well that's oftentimes marketed to young girls, right? To show them how to ensure that the household is taken care of. Men, we don't have that type of stuff. And so we have to navigate through trying to figure out 
what is it, what, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a father? What does it mean to be a husband? And then on top of that, you have some of these guys who don't have that person in their life. And then sometimes even when they do, we don't share as men. So there's so many things that we need to battle and, and, and overcome. Because again, for me personally, I have three boys. And so I need to learn to share with them and I, and I do my best to do so because I'm trying to break that, to share with them what it is to be a young man growing up. And at some point in time, what it's going to be like to, to be dating a young woman and then eventually perhaps marrying a young woman. It is my job to, to ensure that they have those lessons because I want to, I want to do my best to make sure that they're successful. And by doing that, it's my job to share that information, to be that role model. Yeah, I agree with that. Now you talk a lot about resilience. Can we look at that for a few minutes? Absolutely. So, one thing I saw when I was working at Children's Aid, what, you know, people would say children are resilient. And I saw that day in and day out. Now, you know, we have four kids. They're actually close in age to yours. Okay. But I actually, I think a lot about teenagers, right? And the stuff that teenagers are going through now compared to even when we were in high school, um, resilience comes to mind, right? So, you know, they're now living in 2021 with everything else, plus COVID, plus, you know, yes. ABCD, <laughs> right? So when you're speaking to those high school students, can you share with us, what are you, what are you saying to them? Yeah, you know, it, it, it definitely is tough to be a 16, 17 year old. And then everything you said, Tanya, to, to add on COVID and, and social media, you know, I didn't grow up with social media, you know, <laughs> I'm saying at 16 years old, but these kids are born into it. And so they're now, you know, being bullied and, and judged at school, but they're also being bullied and judged online, which never really goes away. And so these kids are dealing with a different level of um, complexities, I would say, that past generations have never had to deal with. One of the things I love to really speak to these, these students about, I just want to remind them that they matter. You know, a while ago, I was, at a, I was in a room with a bunch of a youth, high school kids, we were doing a, a session, and someone said, you know, let's go around the room and everybody give something special about them. Give me one thing that's special about you. And someone went around and was like, you know, I love to cook. I love to bake, blah, blah, blah. And then it got to this one young girl, this young queen. And, and she, you know, she paused for a second. And she said, okay, just skip me. And we're like, why? And she said, yeah, there, there's nothing special about me. You know, I'm just, I'm just average. I'm just normal. And, you know, that, that always stuck with me. And, and to be honest, I've kind of built a story that I often share when I'm giving presentations at schools based on that, because I just really want to remind our students and even adults as well, I want to remind them that they matter. I want to remind them that they are rare. I want to remind them that they are unique. One of the things I tell them is that of the 108 billion people to have ever lived on this earth, I'm talking about from the very first human being from Adam and Eve, all the way to the baby that's being born as we speak right now. There has never been another you. There's never been a you before you. And the day that you leave this world, there will never be another you after you. That speaks to your uniqueness. That speaks to your specialness. It speaks to how rare of a person you are. And I also remind them that the DNA that runs through your body has never been duplicated in the history of the world. The fingerprints that you have on your, on your fingers have never been duplicated to, with anyone else in the world or anyone to come. And so again, it's just a reminder that they're unique and that they are special. And although it appears that you know we, we walk around in this world, you're in a school, you're a one of 800, you're in a workplace, you're one of 10,000, whatever it might be, but you're still special. And I think it's up to us to figure out what that is. Find our unique gift find our passion, find our purpose, and chase it. And that's one of the things I really try to remind these kids about because, you know, I was, I was talking to, so oftentimes I do a, a talk with um, some of the guys who are in prison. And I remind them, I, I talk to them about a caterpillar versus a butterfly. And a caterpillar, when it's a caterpillar, it can only see 
the leaf in front of it. It can't see that there's an entire world out there. All it can see is the leaf in front of it. But at some point in time, that caterpillar, for it to transform into that butterfly, it has to go into this cocoon phase. It's almost like the holding phase. It's a phase that we have to learn and grow and figure out, out who we are. But eventually, when it comes out of that cocoon, it becomes that butterfly. And now when it's that butterfly, it has a chance to, to tour the world. Like literally, you have butterflies that will migrate like birds do. And so they're flying for miles and miles. They're seeing North America, right? Because now they're in that phase of being able to fly. And just like those caterpillars, you know, at some point in time in our life, especially when you're young, all you can see is what's in front of you. All you see is a drug dealing in front of you. If that's where you live. All you see is the domestic violence in front of you, the alcoholism that might be in your home. But at some point in time, I think that all of us have to go into some type of cocoon phase to really say, what is it that I need to do to, to change my life, to transform my life into what I want to do now or what I want to do in the future? And as we move into that thinking, now we become that butterfly. And so one of the examples I share is Maya Angelou, you know, one of the greatest poets of our time. When she was 20 years old, she was a prostitute, caterpillar. But as she changed her life, she became that butterfly. Malcolm X was known as Detroit Red. When he was in jail, he was a thief. He was a, you know, criminal. When he was in jail, you know, at a young age, again, caterpillar. But he was able to morph his life into the person that we all know Malcolm X is today, butterfly. And so I go back, I say all that to say that I, I always try to remind our students that there comes a time in your life that you need to change, whether it means that you drop some of the friends off that you used to hang out with, that you change your thinking, that you, 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 you try different things, you, you grow in certain areas. But for us to really shine and, and be the person, the unique person that we were created to be, and to put, I believe we're all here to put something great into the world, you have to be able to transform yourself from that caterpillar into that butterfly. And so that's one of the things I try to share with our students whenever I get a chance to, to, to talk to any of them in schools. The, the one thing that you mentioned there too, and you know, going back to it was that you, you're just talking about your conversations with, uh, you know, young men who are incarcerated. Yeah. Now we, we hear a lot today about equality and trying to bring a lot of discussions focused on bringing women to a certain level, but you don't really hear the same discussions with men. And when you, when, you know, when you look at the numbers and it, it's, you know, and it's really extreme, the difference when you talk about incarceration, uh, suicide, it, yes. homelessness it's disproportionately men who are yes. you know who are, who are suffering or you know who, who are dealing with these challenges why, why do you think that we don't really hear that message as much i would say that oftentimes it would have to do with society and the betrayal of what a man is supposed to be to be a real man means that you handle your business it means that you don't cry it means that you take care of your household and your family and you're good. And, and, and that's what manhood is. It means that, you know, sexually, you make sure that you're good. It means, you know, like there's a lot of definitions that have been given to us by society. Again, through music, through social media, through, you know, mainstream societal conversations. You know, there's, there's, there's oftentimes, you know, you look at the men's magazine and you see some guy who's buff. And if you don't look like that, then, then you're not considered a real man. And so I think some of the, the, the issues come from the way society has portrayed what man, a man is supposed to be. But the problem is, again, as you talked about, when we as men try to stand into this or, or try to fit into this box that society says what manhood should be, it means then we keep our emotions down because there are times that men need to cry. Because as human beings, we suffer, we go through pain, we have struggles. We all should be able to cry, but society says that men don't cry. And so we bottle that up, we keep it inside and we don't share it. And I think that's one of the issues we have. You know, um, there's a story that, that I've shared. Uh, so years ago, uh, growing up, as I talked about earlier, my family struggled with money at times. And I remember coming home one time and come from school and I flicked on the lights and the lights didn't come on. Right. So I recognized that the power was shut off. And right away, I thought to myself, oh, I have fish. Right. So I used to have pet fish, pet, pet uh, piranhas. Right. And so 
I went to look at the piranhas and they were just staring at me through the glass. Like there's no bubbles coming up, no air filter going on. You know what I'm saying? They're just staring at me like, dude, what's, what's going on? I'm like, I don't know, man. And so the first thing I thought to myself was, okay, so I know that uh, human beings, we suck in oxygen. I believe we use 70 or 80%. I, I could be wrong on my numbers. And then, you know, when you, you give out air, some of the oxygen comes out as well, right? The carbon and air uh, oxygen comes out too. So I thought to myself, let me take the air, the tube that goes into the fish tank and blow in it, right? Because I'm trying to save my fish, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so I unplug it and I'm blowing into this tube, trying to blow some of my oxygen into the fish tank. And so my fish are staring at me like, bro, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> and so I do this for a while. My cheeks hurt. I'm kneeling on the ground. My knees hurt. I'm in pain. I'm like, I, I can't do this anymore. And so at some point in time, I, I check on my fish. They're good. They look okay. I go to bed. I wake up the next morning and right away I think, oh my goodness, my fish. And I go down to check on them and they're all dead, mm. right? They're all dead. And so I remember thinking to myself, obviously the oxygen ran out because the electricity is not on to pump the air into the water. And I remember thinking to myself, I wonder when they were staring at me, if they were actually screaming, but because I don't speak fish and fish don't speak human, I wonder if we just didn't communicate, we couldn't understand each other. I thought to myself, I wonder if they are screaming in silence. And I use that analogy because men are screaming in silence. Men are oftentimes screaming in silence. When you see these young men, they're walking out in the streets and their pants are hanging and you know they're selling drugs and, and you know they're carrying guns. They're doing it and they know what they're doing is wrong, but they're doing it because they don't have any other influence to show them what a man should be. They're suffering in silence. I've had a lot of friends and just, you know, associates as well over the years where I've reached out to them and said, hey, you know, I'm looking for some men to come down and speak to the school for with these kids and, and, and you know, just kind of interact with them. And I've had some guys say, nah, I'm, I'm not I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah, you know, I'm just going through some stuff and, you know, I, I'm just not there yet. And this is based on them maybe going through a divorce or going through financial issues or losing their job. And so because we as men look at these things as being manly, when we get into those funks, we feel that we're not at par or we're not adequate enough. Not knowing that the experience you have as an adult is, is like, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's so much in terms of what you can give to these children, to these students, your experience, like even if you feel like you're at a five, your five is still somebody else's 10. And so because men suffer in silence, we scream in silence, we don't share, but we're struggling, we decide that we're not gonna share with anybody. And because we decide not to share, our children, the next generation, they don't get the information that they need to have from us. And so it's just a cycle that just continues when we don't decide, when we decide as men that we're not going to share our experiences because I'm still going through it. I'm still struggling. I'm still having my issues. And so we don't pass those things on. So you have the next generation that suffers in silence as well. I think looking at self-worth, uh, you know, you've talked about it a little bit in the resilience piece, right? But looking also at the fact that we are all a work in progress, right? Yes. Um, so, you know, you're saying, yes, as men, I can never relate to that, but, you know, struggling in silence, but what are we doing to become better, right? So looking at that as adult and then teaching our kids that as well is something that I think as adults, yes, we need to be able to understand that and be able to provide the resources for ourselves, but also be able to teach that to our kids that, yeah, you know, you're struggling with this, but let's come up with a game plan. You know, let's work on making this situation better. Yes. When you're talking with kids or, you know, with parents, how, what, what are you saying to them? One of the things I often speak about is I call it the Superman syndrome. So you all are parents, so you know, your children look at you like you are a superhero. 
that's what children do. We looked at our parents like they're superheroes. My dad was a superman. My mother was a superwoman. They did amazing things. And now that I'm older, I could see where there was flaws, right? Because I'm an adult now. I'm looking at it through adult eyes. And I could see those flaws when they were growing up. But as a child, they were your superhero. And one of the things that I say is we can't change that. No, no, I don't think we should either, right? Our children are going to look at us as superheroes. However, I think it's also important that we show our children the Clark Kent, right? So Superman was a strong guy who, you know, nothing could be could beat him outside of the uh, the green, um, what you call it, the uh, kryptonite. The kryptonite. Thank you very much. The kryptonite. But no, I'm a Marvel guy, so you know what I mean. <laughs> I, I forgot about that DC stuff. <laughs> and so, you know, that's who Superman was, or again, Superwoman. But Clark Kent was that guy who was vulnerable. Clark Kent was the guy who was clumsy. Clark Kent had a crush on Lois Lane and didn't know how to tell her, right? There was vulnerability that was there that Superman just didn't have. I think it's important that as parents, we show our children the Clark Kent, meaning that we show them the vulnerability. You know, my, my sons, especially my oldest one, because obviously as time goes on, he's the one that I, I experience, you know, in terms of getting older. And what I'll say to him is, you know, what, every time he has a birthday, I say, you know, I've never parented an 11 year old boy before. It's my very first time. And so guess what? As you change and you become the person who you're supposed to become, daddy's changing and becoming that dad that needs to be there for that 11 year old boy, that, that, that 12 year old boy. And daddy's never done this before. So there are going to be times that I make mistakes. There's, are going to be, there's going to be times that maybe daddy comes home and daddy's frustrated because of something at work. And I want to apologize now. I don't mean to take it out on you, but sometimes that's what happens. And I share these things with him because I want him to see my Clark Kent. I want him to see the vulnerability. So I want him to know that daddy does make mistakes. And so it's okay for you to make mistakes as well. That's one of the things I like to share with parents because kids, again, will always see us as that superhero. And we shouldn't change that, but we should show them the other side as well, because as they get older, sometimes they become disappointed because they didn't know that other side existed. But when we let them know that that side, that it, it's been here since before you were born, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you need to know that daddy's vulnerable. Daddy, has, you know, daddy sometimes has issues. You know what I'm saying? Like this is who we are as human beings. It lets them know that, yeah, daddy is Clark Kent. I'm sorry, daddy is Superman, but daddy is Clark Kent as well. Show them our vulnerabilities. That's something I like to share with, with parents. So just in all of your work, you know, the speaking, the, the writing, you've had the opportunity to do some pretty unique things. Tell us about meeting Barack Obama. Ooh, man. <laughs> this is one of my favorite stories, and I, and I haven't shared it a whole lot. It just, it just hasn't really come up. So... <laughs> So I wrote a book called New Me, myself and nine of the guys, so 10 of us together. We all wrote a chapter and we talk about how we fell down in certain places in our lives and life, but then how we got back up. And so because we wrote this book, somebody who was planning that event saw the value in the book. She really loved that we were putting ourselves out there to the community. And she was like, yo, we want to invite you guys to come to the Barack Obama event coming to Toronto. I was like, what? Super excited. The guys in the book, super excited. So, you know, if you go to a wedding, you have the wedding table at the front of the room, and then you have the bride's family or mom and dad and, and the groom's mom and dad right beside the bride's table uh, or the, the, um, the wedding party's table. That's where we were sitting at the so-called, you know, the, the mother and father table. So on one side, like right in front of the stage was us. And on the other side was uh, Justin Trudeau's wife, like, like just an arm's reach. I was like, this is crazy, crazy. <laughs> so super excited. We get to the venue and they tell me, you know, Jeff, based on the work that you've been doing, we want to gift you something. I'm like, this is gift enough to be in the room with Barack. Crazy. They're like, you get a chance to meet him. I'm like, say what? <laughs> They're like, you, you get a chance to meet him. So I'm like, oh, okay, uh, let's go. So all the other guys, all the other authors, my wife was there too. They're like, yo, you got to get him one of these books. And I'm like, there's no way. They're like, yo, you got to get him a copy of the book. You have to try to get him a copy. So I get a copy of the book, I sign it, you know, to um, uh, Mr. Obama, we appreciate who you are, and what you've been, what you've done for, you know, the entire world, sign the book, I have it in my hand, I'm in a room with maybe 50 people. So the event has maybe 20,000 people, there are 50 people in this room who get a chance to actually meet Barack Obama, and I'm one of them. I don't even know how that works. It's, it's crazy even to this day when I think about it. And so I'm lined up in line, and I have this book with me. 
And of course, there are secret services everywhere, like everywhere in this room. And so Barack is behind the curtain. I can't see him, but at some point in time, he enters a room and the line starts to move. So I'm like, oh, he's obviously in the room. I have the book in my hand. And at, at some point as the line is moving, we get to a table and they tell us everything in your pockets has to go on the table. No keys, no cell phones, everything goes on the table. We're going to take a picture of, it, of you with him and then we'll send it to you. But you can't have a selfie like nothing. So I, I empty my pockets, put it all on the table, and I still have the book in my hand. And I'm like, do I put the book down or do I take it with me? So I'm like, listen, I don't want to get shot here by secret services. So let me let me ask somebody, right? So I asked one of the secret service guys. I'm like, can I give him this book? He's like, no, there's no way. And I'm like, okay, um, can I hold the book and you know take a picture with him? And I'm holding the book. And so he whispers to another guy who whispers to another guy. And they come back. They're like, yeah, you can do that. I'm like, for real? And they're like, yeah. So I'm like, oh man, let's go. So I'm going to have this book in a picture with Barack, right? So I have this book and I'm getting closer and closer. I, I break the corner and I can see him. He is live. Like he is front in front of me, like, you know, as live as anybody is. And the person in front of me goes, they shake his hand. They say two words to him. They move off. And now it's my turn. And as I take a step towards the past president, Barack Obama, one of the Secret Service guys beside me, he looks over in my hand, sees the book, and he snatches it from me right in the last minute. And I'm at the point where it's my turn. Like, Brock's looking at me, and I want to say to this guy, no, 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 I got permission from your other guy. You guys didn't get a chance to talk. But I can't say anything at that moment because Barack is looking at me like, bro, are you coming? <laughs> and so I, I approach Barack, almost depressed. Like, who approaches Barack Obama depressed, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, I am, like, I don't even know what to say. And he's like, hey, how you doing? What's your name? I'm like, Jeff, sir. And he's like, oh, Jeff, okay, perfect. Nice to meet you, man. I'm like, sir, thank you so much for everything. He's like, man, thank you so much. Great to meet you. We take a picture. It's done. We move on. And I'm heartbroken. So at that moment now, there's somebody who's working there. And I say, hey, is there any way I can get this book to his people and they're like, yeah, absolutely. Like she seems enthusiastic. She's like, yeah, absolutely. So I give her the book. I leave the room. And I don't know what happens after that. I don't know if he takes the book. I don't know if it ends up in the trash. I don't know if it went on the plane with him back to Chicago or Washington, wherever he was living at the time. But that was my opportunity, right? You, you don't, you know, if you don't shoot, you don't score. You know what I'm saying? So that was a story of how I met Barack Obama. And um, to this day, I'm hoping one day he tweets about the book. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well I, i'm sure he's listening so barack make sure make sure you tweet about the book <laughs> hey come on my man you gotta tweet about the book <laughs> and, oh, man. and i guess you know the, the the one thing i will say is at least you don't look depressed in the picture so that you know that that's that's impressive <laughs> that is true that is true yeah yeah it was a quick moment but again i'm grateful because it all came through based on work right is it based on putting myself in the game um, it didn't happen by luck. It didn't happen by chance. I don't believe anything's by luck and by chance. I believe it happened because I was able to put myself in the space of really trying to serve. And somebody recognized it and they said, hey, you know, Jeff, we want to gift you an opportunity. So I'm grateful. I I'm totally grateful for that opportunity. I gave myself a, a quick pat on the back saying, Jeff, good job. And then I kept it moving because I think that there's so much more work that needs to be done. You know, who knows? Maybe my next stop is Oprah's couch. You know what I'm saying? We'll, we'll see how it goes down. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, there's just so much work to do, in my opinion. There's so many people who are lost and, and confused and going down paths that they, if they had some guidance, they wouldn't need to go down. And I'm trying to do my best to help to fill that role with some people in their lives. So there's a lot of work to do. All right. So Barack, make sure you tweet about the book and then Oprah, you can bring them on the show. So <laughs> Absolutely. I'm, I'm waiting for that call from Marple Studios or own network, I guess, at this point <laughs> in time. <laughs> oh, man. No. The, the, so I'm just curious now with it, you know, with everything that you've been doing, you know, we've gotten your background and, and we covered a lot of ground in this conversation so far. What was the spark that really made you find your voice and decide that you were going to take this road of public speaking and, and writing and really sharing this message, this really important message with people? Yeah, you know, growing up, I grew up in a tough neighborhood. And oftentimes when I was growing up, I would see a lot of police, right? In, the, in tough neighborhoods, you, you typically see a lot of police uh, presence. And it always felt like every time the police came around, it felt like it was harassment. It felt like we were being harassed and picked on. But I remember thinking to myself, you know, what if somebody had that type of power that these police officers have, and they actually used it to help the community grow? 
They use it to help these young kids in the community to become better. And so that's something that I, that always stuck with me. And so as I got older and was trying to figure out what career path I wanted to go down, I decided that, yeah, I think policing is going to be the way to go. And so I pushed, I shoved, I fought, and I finally got hired as a police officer. Now, 15 days later, after being hired by a police, by a, a police service, I remember I woke up that morning, it was a Monday morning, and I looked at my cell phone and I had about 25 missed phone calls that came in throughout the night. And right away, of course, I knew something was wrong. I started to scroll through and I saw that it was all family. I eventually called back one of my cousins who was trying to call me and she was crying on the other line. And I, I said, cuz, what's going on? And the more she tried to speak, it's the more that she cried. And I was, you know, I said, cuz, I'm getting nervous. I'm getting scared, but you got to tell me what's happening. And finally, she was able to blurt out and tell me that Omar was dead. So Omar was my cousin, my younger cousin. And in fact, he was like a little brother to me because uh, when he came to Canada, I'm the one that taught him uh, how to play basketball. I taught him how to navigate the school system. I taught him how to talk to women, the young women as well. <laughs> <laughs> and Omar on August 15th, on his birthday, August 15th, 2005, Omar went to celebrate uh, his 27th birthday at the Phoenix nightclub downtown Toronto. And while he was out there at some point in time, he went outside um, middle of the night and uh, someone drove by, uh, the back window came down, they pulled out a gun, pulled the trigger and shot Omar at point blank range. And for me, it was such a struggle because I had just become a police officer. So it was a part of me that promised I was going to protect and serve. But there was the other side of me who grew up in that tough neighborhood, who learned a lot of tough lessons, including revenge. And I wanted to go out there and to handle my business. I wanted those killers to, to feel, the family of those killers to feel the exact pain that I and my family were feeling by losing Omar. I wanted them to feel the exact same thing. And it was a struggle for me for a long time to really figure out what direction was I going to go? Like, what would the headlines read? Like, I, I, I imagine that, you know, brand new police officer takes his gun and goes and kills the person who killed his cousin. And it, again, it was a heavy time for me. I pushed a lot of people away, including my girlfriend, who is now my wife, right? So she didn't go that far away, but you know, um, it was a heavy time for me, but it was through a conversation that I had with someone that really changed my life. And this person let me know that as human beings, we're always going to put out energy. We always put out something, but it's up to us, either we make the energy positive or negative. It's up to us how we're going to dictate through life. We always get a chance to choose. No matter how difficult the circumstance is, we are always in control. And of course, you know, right now we're dealing with COVID. We can't control that, but we can control who we show up as every single day. And so at that time, I really, you know, that really played in my mind. And ultimately it led me to the person, uh, to the person who I am today. And so, you know, I thought about, do I go out there and do what I know I shouldn't be doing and end up being another statistic? Or do I use what happened, use the energy of losing Omar to go into these schools and try to talk the next guy out of pulling a gun, try to talk the next girl out of, um, you know, dropping out of school or, 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 you know, the teenage pregnancy thing, or, you know, use my voice to really make change. And it was through that circumstance that really turned my life into what it is today. I speak now because my passion, as much as, you know, I'll speak to any school or any it, it, even corporations, I do corporations as well. My passion is speaking to some of these at-risk schools, these underserved communities, because I want to try to get to the ears of some of these young men who are on the verge of grabbing a gun and doing the exact same thing. Because I know the pain of what it feels like on the other ends of losing a loved one. And so that's why I do what I do now. Um, because I want to be that individual who can perhaps talk that gun out of that person's hand. And I got to tell you, Tanya and Brian, you know, I've been so blessed based on that circumstance of, of, of really just trying to be that change. You know, there's a while ago, I went and spoke at a school and I did about three or four sessions with uh, some sevens and eights, grade sevens and eights. And at the end of the last session, a young girl came up to me and she said, Jeff, I've been listening to everything you've been saying. And based on what you've said, I've decided, and she stopped. 
And she pulled her sleeve up and I could see all the self-inflicted wounds. And she said, Jeff, based on what you said, I decided I'm going to stop self-harming. And it just, it, you know, it, it, it made, I was speechless. I was speechless because if I decided to go down the path of that negativity and go out there and do that thing that I wanted to do, I would not be making the impact on people's lives that I'm making today. And so I just want to remind people that no matter what it is you're going through, we always get a chance to choose. We can always choose. I know we sometimes we get stuck in that job that we hate. We get stuck in that relationship that we can't stand. We get stuck in circumstances that we feel like our life is not ours. But we always ultimately get a chance to choose. What are we choosing? Again, I can't choose COVID-19 if it's here or not. I can't choose that 2020 and even 2021, the racial unrest that's shown its face. You know, I can't choose that. But what I can choose is how I show up each and every day. I get to choose that in good times and in bad. I get to choose when I wake up in the morning that my feet hit the ground that I could say thank you because it's another opportunity that I can go out there and make change in someone's life. And so it, it's through losing Omar why I do what I do. And of course, if I could turn back the hands of time and bring him back, absolutely I would, but I know that I can't do that. That's not the way life works. And so the next best thing is to use my voice to help to make change. And that's why I do what I do. That's one of the main things that has driven me to try to get into every single school that I can, whether it be physically, whether it be virtually, whether it be through my books, um, you know, whether it be, you know, whatever it might be to get into these schools and have the biggest effect that I can on the students to help them mold them into the adults that they need to be. So in terms of um, speaking, where, where can we hear you speaking? You know, I, I'll just give you an opportunity to really tell us everything that you're doing. You know, we got the book, New Me, which is K-N-E-W. Uh, yes. You know, Barack Obama's one of his top five. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, <laughs> speaking to existence. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you have that book there you know there's other books that you've written there's the podcast you know fill us fill us in on what you're going to be up to where we can find you all that good stuff yeah oh man thank you very much yeah I, you know if anybody's looking for a speaker to come out to their organization i've been doing a lot of work on diversity and inclusion speaking to some of the more the, the major corporations in canada getting you know an opportunity again super super blessed to do that Again, going to schools that I spoke about earlier, just talking to our children about resilience, about diversity and inclusion as well with our students. You know, and, and again, if anyone's just looking to find me to reach out, you can reach me on social media, Jeff A.D. Martin. You know, you can find me there. But yeah, just, you know, I'm always trying to, you know, look for the next idea to really help to make our community better. Uh, again, I am working on another book as well that I'm hoping will come out in, in 2021. And um, I run a youth, uh, youth session as well for high school kids and college kids that we do via Zoom on Sunday afternoons. Again, really looking just to bring ideas and thoughts to our kids, talk to them about financial literacy, talk about goal setting and really reaching their dreams and, and finding the biggest potentials. And then I do coaching as well. I do one-on-one -on -one coaching, mentoring work. Uh, helping people to, to again, become the best version of them. So that's this is kind of some of the things that I've been involved with is really trying to help to, to make change in people's lives. That's perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jeff. I'm so glad that I ran into you on LinkedIn. And yes. uh, I saw your profile on like, obviously my mind is always thinking of the podcast now, but I'm like, this is something that I knew that we could benefit from, um, as well as so many other people, just from having conversation with you that, you know, we can go back and share with our kids and to keep some of this information um, for when they get older too, because, you know, that's when things are going to get really crazy, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, and that's when, you know, the true molding is going to be happening, right? But uh, we thank you so much for taking this time out and talking with us tonight. And um, we wish you all the best. Oh, awesome. Thank you. And again, I want to say thank you to both of you just for allowing me to be on your platform, allowing me to speak and share. And I'm hoping that, you know, the listeners get a chance just to really absorb some of the things I spoke about. And I'm hoping that some of it, you know, will help to change your life, whether it be as a parent, whether it be as an individual who's suffering, who's struggling, going through life, um, having adversities, you know, there's always opportunities for us to become better, to grow um, as better parents, as better human beings. And so I'm hoping to do that with this podcast. So again, thank you so much for allowing me on your stage. Keep up the great work. Keep doing your thing and inspiring both of you. Inspiring. Thank you.
Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.